Coming up next is Forbidden Fruit with Lionel Shriver, Manil Suri, Amrita Narayanan, and Annie Zaidi in conversation with Margaret Mascarenas. Please join me in welcoming our speakers onto the stage. Okay, I'm just going to get started. I'm Margaret Mascarenas, and I'll be moderating this panel on Forbidden Fruit. And I'll just get started introducing the panel while everybody gets uh, settled. And I'll start with Annie Zaidi, who is immediately to my left. Uh, Annie is the author of Gulab, Love Stories, 1 to 14, Known Turf, Bantering with Bandits and Other True Tales, and most recently, she has painstakingly edited an amazing anthology, Unbound, 2,000 Years of Women's Writing. Um, welcome. Uh, next, we have Amrita Narayan, who uh, is a psychoanalyst. She has a private practice in Goa, where I also live. And uh, she's the author of a book of short fiction, A Pleasant Kind of Heavy, and other stories. And uh, although she wrote it anonymously, that's how I met her um, some years ago. Uh, she uh, is currently editing uh, an anthology that I'm very interested in um, called The Parrots of Desire which also covers quite a wide span of history, 1,800 years. Uh, the full title is The Parrots of Desire, 1,800 Years of Erotic Fiction in India. I don't know if it's exclusively women's fiction or whether it includes everything. Yeah, sorry. Then we have um, Manil Suri, who is the author of the trilogy Death of Vishnu, The Age of Shiva, and most recently, The City of Devi, which I am just finished two days ago, uh, which imagines the present past and imagined future of India. I mean, he's very interesting to me as a mathematician because like, as he has uh, frequently noted in his interviews, uh, the reaction of most people when you bring up mathematics is sort of, you know, they go into a coma. So it's very interesting to me. Uh, that he, uh, as a mathematician, is so highly literary because many of us don't put those two together. Um, and finally, we have someone whose books I have been reading for a long time, Lionel Shriver, uh, but who I only met recently. Uh, she's the author of a number of novels, but most notably, we need to talk about Kevin, which has been turned into a movie. Her most recent book is Big Brother, which I also just finished a few days ago and loved it. And she has an upcoming book called The Mandibles, which I'm very much looking forward to, <coughs> uh, which addresses the, uh, or prophesizes the collapse of the American dollar. We hope it's fiction, but it might not be. <laughs> oh, but they, we weren't all sure how, how we got uh, on this panel together, but um, it is clear that uh, many of them uh, write, and so do I, on subjects that might be considered um, dangerous or forbidden territory, so we're going to try and address that. I'm going to go back to my seat and we'll get the conversation going. Thank you. Can you hear me? Okay, so Annie, I want to start with you because um, your anthology Unbound uh, seems to me the area of your work or interest that would most uh, aptly fit into this topic. And you and I had a conversation briefly yesterday about um, your inclusion of a particular author Madhu Palani. Can you hear me? Madhu Palani. And uh, which uh, 
the work, of the title in English is The Appeasement of Radhika. And I wanted to ask you a little more about why you included that particular work and what was the, uh, whether it involved any controversy, your inclusion of it, and what was your experience with that? Um, the Appeasement of Radhika is a translation of uh, Radhika Santvanam by Muddu Pallini. This is a 18th century text in Telugu. Um, when it was written, it was not at all controversial. Muddu Pallini was supposed to be a Devdasi. She was attached to the court of the king. She was... Uh, 18th century? Early 18th century, yeah. And, uh, or perhaps mid 18th, I'm not sure of the date exactly, but yes, it was the 18th century. Um, this is when, when um, the Europeans had started to come to India, the British had arrived, but uh, they were not really in charge of the country. They were, the kingdoms still had a significant uh, cultural and, and, and certainly political uh, independence. Madhupallini at this time was writing and was being celebrated as, uh, a, as an accomplished writer at this time. Uh, Radhika Santvanam is, um, it is an erotic text, uh, there is no doubt about that. But like several texts of the time, um, not necessarily erotic or anything else, a lot of texts were riffing off on the epics. So for instance, uh, Mullah's Ramayan uh, describes a very sensual um, uh, kind of first encounter bit between Ram and Sita, which is, you know, when he sees her, he falls in love with her. Whether or not this was in the original text is a separate issue, but all the writers were doing this. And what Mudu Pallini does is describes what happens when Krishna gets married to Ila um, and Radhika supports the marriage, encourages Ila also to love Krishna, but then becomes jealous. And, um, and, and a lot of the book is uh, a description of carnal encounters between Radhika and Krishna. And at that time it was not controversial. But what happened yeah, that's what I was just by the 19th century, what happened is that by that time, the British were kind of more or less running the country. And there was this whole group of social reformers who felt that the text is not appropriate. That it is, um, and in fact the text was more or less lost. What happened was that another woman, uh, a singer, um, discovered the text, republished it because she thought it was beautiful and that set off a storm and a controversy and there were calls to ban the text and it was banned and it, the ban remained in force until after independence when it was finally lifted and then finally the book was translated into English in quite recent decades and published as The Beastment of Radhika. I think it is brilliant uh, in its own way, It is, but mainly included it not just for its literary merit, I'm sure there is literary merit. Uh, in English it sounds very beautiful and sensual, in Telugu it must be even more so because it's in verse. But also because we kind of forget that this also is our culture, this is a part of our heritage and it is not this whole thing of, you know, that this kind of writing does not belong to India, of course it belongs right. to India, it belongs here more than anywhere, anywhere else I would believe. So that was one of the main reasons why I did include it. I wanted you to uh, elaborate a little more on, on in this context that you've just raised, which is the kind of shifting sands over time of what is and is not forbidden. Could you talk a little bit, because you must have thought about it quite a lot when you were working on this anthology. Wait, yeah, for instance, the, the thing of love and desire and longing, um, and desire being both physical and emotional, um, this has been part of our earliest literature. If, if you've seen um, uh, this book of poems called The Absent Traveller, which Arvind Krishnamerotra has translated, these are Prakrit writings. And Prakrit means, Prakrit was the language of the people, it was not Sanskrit. So these were people who were writing, or through oral kind of verses, passing things down, and a lot of them are full of desire. And there are references to adultery, there are references to cheating on your husband, there are references to longing for your husband, all of it is part of that. And because it was so commonplace, it was folk literature. If it's commonplace, it means that it was happening all around. And I think the fact that people were saying these things 
in, in their verses, in their songs, uh, means that it was fairly mainstream. It was certainly not forbidden yeah, at that just time. Just part of the culture. Yeah, but over time, the, just the expression of, for instance, talking about cheating about your husband has become uh, not only unpalatable, but absolutely forbidden uh, as, as an expression of just self-expression. Um, and, and How much do you think the Victorian period has influenced uh, our uh, thinking in India on, uh, on moral values, for example, to the extent that maybe some of the uh, ideas and attitudes that are being currently espoused about what is... For example, we had yesterday, even on, a, on our panel, someone stand up and try to indicate that, you know, women shouldn't be writing these things. Um, do you think that is an evolution of, uh, of culture in India, that it's, you know, cultures swing like pendulums and cycles recur, or do you think there is a Western influence I think there into. may have been some Western influence for sure. So for instance, in the Mudupalani case, obviously the same region, like sort of South India and, and that territory, um, changed, something changed. The power structure changed and the values of the rulers obviously had an impact on the rest of the culture. But, but even before you can say the British kind of uh, Victorian kind of empire took over India, the Indian society had already changed quite significantly. So for instance, by the 18th century, the upper castes uh, had completely kind of the expectations of women and what women were supposed to do and not do uh, were completely different from what a century ago, even before the British had arrived or had any influence in India. Um, to the extent that in the by the 19th century, child marriage was more or less the norm. A girl of 11 was supposed to be too old to be married, and a girl of uh, uh, and, and women were not supposed to. But upper caste women and upper class women, particularly, were not supposed to get educated at all, even if their parents had the means. They had to fight to even learn the letters and and kind of go to school and things like that. So, do you think at that time there would have been a, that would have been a, a point where there was a, a separation in the literature between the folkloric literature of you were describing earlier and, say, the uh, upper caste? Well, there was actually a big gap as far as women's literature is concerned. We just don't see very much of women's literature up until the 19th century when the print revolution happened. Because earlier, what was what came down to us was oral. It, it was passed down That's right. um, and remembered and recorded. Uh, obviously, something somewhere had shifted because for two centuries before that, there's just not a lot of it, or at least we don't have access to it. Okay, thank you. Um, I'd like to move on to Amrita. Um, Amrita, I, I'm going to try and connect a little bit from what uh, Annie was talking about, the folkloric literature. And I want to make a point that, as I was talking to you earlier, that um, your book, to my knowledge, I mean, I'm sure there must be some in, in, uh, in languages that have not been translated into English yet, or at least that I haven't seen. But um, your work, your book of short stories, um, a pleasant kind of heavy, reminded me quite a bit of a precursor to that some years ago, maybe 15 years ago, there was a book of short stories by Ginu Kamani, who addressed the uh, women's sexuality from a domestic point of view. That means the worker, the um, maid, the girl who does the waxing in the beauty parlor. And this was quite unusual when she came out with it, and I don't know how many people would be familiar with it or whether it's even still in print. Um, but uh, what, what she did reminded me of what you've done, and I think that's the first time I've seen it done in a long time. And that's actually one of the criticisms um, that I've seen around of my of my book, that this kind of sexuality or sensuality of everyday life, it's going They're not a bit supposed to have it. 
Yes, as we were talking about yesterday, I think we're very used to exporting sex to, to Goa, to, to the West, and as you were saying also, Annie, that it's somehow not Indian, which actually came up at the end of our session yesterday. Someone said it's not Tamil, even though the Tamil Sangam literature very much uh, espouses this sexuality of everyday life. Um, and yet there's a disavowal of it in, in the popular consciousness. Um, and it's something I struggled with when I was writing, because when you have um, these kind of layers of shame uh, in the collective culture, uh, when we're disavowing a certain subject, I think as a writer, if you're writing into that subject, you, you're scratching at that. Somehow it keeps coming up. So this is something that I've you know, wanted to ask you, and I never really did, I think, in all the years that we've known each other now. Would, would that struggle be the reason that you initially wrote this book under an assumed name? Why did you do that? Well, at a very personal level, I think that was really my family, that's my, my family of origin was very, very against the idea of me, me publishing it. But I think, I think you're probably right. I think there's some um, anxiety about uh, stepping forward and saying that uh, I wrote this book about um, the sexuality of everyday life and um, you know, here I am, hello. Uh, so I think there was probably some anxiety there, but also uh, at that time, because as you say, there had not been a book like that in a really long time. Um, since then, there's been a plethora of books that really intimately talk about sexuality, but there hadn't been anything like that, so I was uh, a little nervous and perhaps playing it safe. Were there any repercussions to you finally coming out as the, <laughs> as the author of this book? No. Um, no, so that anxiety wasn't really warranted, do Well, you think? it was warranted in the, in the family, in the personal, it's a very personal context. It's not that I feared people in the outside world. But it's not a memoir. I mean, attacking. Not, it, it wasn't a personal memoir that I can <laughs> I'd have to tell you to talk to my mother. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, you know, I, I don't think it's a... Um, it's something that we, we, we could laugh about, we could treat it lightheartedly, but it's actually not, not it's completely not uh, irrelevant. It, yeah. it, I mean, we, we may laugh at it, and it, it, I hope we can laugh at it. But, you know, if you think about uh, C.S. Lakshmi's work, The Face Behind the Mask, writing about Tamil women, and the, just the importance of modesty, it's, it's a kind of a life or death issue. And this, um, even a fractional loss of modesty means a loss of the self, a loss of the internal self. And, and I think there was an awareness of that in me as I wrote, and um, maybe also as I, as I chose to initially write under a pen name. You know, I teach, I'm... A, uh, known in my professional life that it might mean something to other people and and I think there's a lo lot of history of that uh, in India even if it doesn't mean something to the person themselves that uh, the collective interprets women freely speaking about sexuality in a very particular way and we don't have control over that particular way. We have control about what we write and the name under which we write, but we don't have control over what the collective uh, sort of does with that. Does your background as a psychoanalyst uh, influence the way you uh, process your creative work? Does that come into it at all? Um, I think writers and psychoanalysts are doing something very similar, which is that they're scrubbing at the unconsciousness, they're working with images and uh, material that come from, from the unconscious. Um, so I think it's very related work. Um, I'm not an analyst, actually. I'm in training to be an analyst. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, but yes, I think there's something about the way in which analysts and writers form narrative um, that's very similar, and there's a book about that. Do you find any intersect between, it's a, I, I mean, I read in your bio that you have a pri private practice. Do you find any intersect uh, between? Well, well, it's interesting you say that because, uh, you know, coming out of writing this, this book of um, erotic stories about women expressing their erotic lives. I started to have a question halfway through the book, is, am I making this all up? And, um, and I started doing some research 
uh, and it ended up being a two-year research project interviewing women uh, about their sexuality and their overlap of their identity and the overlap of their identity and their sexuality and how important uh, keeping secrets about the sexual life is to what we construe as Indian identity. Um. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to move sort of in this trajectory. We'll, uh, can you hear me? Um, I'd like to ask uh, Manu Suri about uh, uh, Manil Suri about the um, the overlay of Hindu mythology and in his work and the concept of the Trinity in your three novels. I'd like to get started with that, and maybe if you could describe your rationale for the use, the heavy use of mythology and archetype to address, highlight political, social and also gender issues in okay. India. Okay, before I do that though, I'd like to uh, say a little bit about what you said uh, in terms of uh, actually reading out in India. Um, like the last book that I wrote was The City of Devi and it had a lot of gay sex scenes. And before I was, uh, the, first, the first time I read was in Calcutta and they said, you know, it's a very conservative city, whatever you do, don't read out the sex scenes. <laughs> so, so naturally that's exactly what I did. Uh, I read them out, and you know, one or two people kind of maybe have left or something, but nothing else happened. You know, nobody fainted, there were no ambulances <laughs> called, and, and that's been my experience time and time again. Like, I've had my parents, my uncles, my aunts, and they always sit there and, you know, read, hear what I'm saying, and then say, very good, and, you know, seem to, seem to be okay with it. So, I think we sometimes think that people are a lot more fragile than they are, so... You know, that's something to keep in mind. Um, in, terms of, in terms of how my mythology re relates to this, uh, you know, first of all, forbidden fruit. I think in India the forbidden fruit is always sex. I mean, that seems to be the main forbidden fruit. And I don't think it's because of Indian culture necessarily, but as you were saying earlier, it is because of you know, the Victorian attitudes that have permeated things. One of the big and things... And the laws. And the laws, Section 377, for instance, is a holdover from the British. If you look at Singapore and other countries, they also have Section 377 as the same rule against sodomy. So uh, some of these things aren't really Indian. That's, that's the main thing. Uh, and one of the things with mythology is that you can actually go into actual myths that have come down to us from the ages and really see how some of these human dramas are played out. You know, what is sex after all? It's, it's another form of interaction between human beings. And I think the sages, the people who were writing these myths and who gave us all these enormously uh, influential works, they understood this better than some of us do in present times. And so when we read these, we can actually see how human beings interact. So that's one of the things that I've been trying to get through these three uh, books in the trilogy, uh, whether it is you know, the Oedipus myth, where, uh, where uh, uh, there's an attraction between uh, a male son and his mother, which is played out in the mythology of Shiva over and over again, uh, or if it's uh, just the fact that you know, Krishna and uh, Vishnu in particular is so full of full of energy and full of uh, procreative ability that he's the one who makes the world keep going. So these are all things that are necessary for human interaction and one of the key things is to bring them out through mythology. Um, so, Did you have a plan for that or you, for a trilogy? You seem to be very into trinities also so I, w I was wondering what that, what that signifies. Does it have to do with your mathematical background? Uh, not really. I think all it has to do with is that I wrote my first book uh, which was the death of Vishnu and then, uh, and then it just came to me, wait a minute, there are three gods, Vishnu, Shiva and Brahma so I can write a trilogy. Um, so I told my agent that I was going to do that because the publisher had been asking what I was going to do afterwards. And then I thought to myself, you know, it took me six years to write this first book. What have I got myself into? So I told my agent, don't tell the publishers about this trilogy idea, this trinity idea. And she said, well, no, I've already told them and they love the idea, so whether you like it or not, you're writing a trilogy. 
<laughs> so that's how I spent my last, uh, whatever, 18 years or so. Uh, and, you know, these things develop. Like the third part of the trilogy was supposed to be about Brahma, who's the traditional third part in the Hindu trinity. But then when you start digging into things, it turns out that the true god who is worshipped a lot more is, uh, is the mother goddess, the Devi goddess. And so she seemed to be the really correct person to add to the trinity. So that's how it evolved over time. Yeah, I wanted you to talk a little bit more about the channeling of women's voices that you do quite well and whether that was an effort for you or whether it really came naturally. I think the, uh, it, it was interesting because uh, with the first book, The Death of Vishnu, I was actually criticized. Uh, people would uh, get up and say, you know, all the spiritual people in the book, they're all men that the women never reach the same level of spiritual enlightenment as the men do. And, you know, all I would say is, well, you know, I mean, I'm not an equal opportunity employer. You know, this is, uh, this is a novel. It's not supposed to be uh, an exact thing. But that, that perhaps led me to my second book, which was all told in the uh, voice of Mira, who is speaking to her son, essentially. So the whole book is from a female point of view. So I, I kind of forced myself to really live with Mira for a long time. I mean, I guess she's one of the, I guess she's the longest relationship I've ever had with a woman, uh, <laughs> other than my mother, probably. Uh, and so Mira was someone that, you know, I really had to work with. Uh, like the first scene is uh, where she is uh, actually with breastfeeding her son. And so I really had to think about, well, if I was holding a child, where would the mouth be, where would the legs be, and so on, and really put myself into her place. So, so that was a very interesting thing. And then in the third book, you know, I had two narrators, both a man and a woman. So that was, um, again, the female character was very interesting to put yourself into that sphere. Okay, well, I want to go back to the age of Shiva, and in fact, the opening of the age of Shiva, because uh, when you uh, address the subject of the mother-male-child relationship, you have uh, sexualized the scene of the breastfeeding to such a degree that at first you, don't, you think it's a scene between a man and a woman. And I'd actually, to give the audience an idea of that, if they haven't read the book yet, I'd actually like you to read that opening to okay. us. Okay, so I'll read just a little bit from that. Every time I touch you, every time I kiss you, every time I offer you my body, Ashwin, do you know how tightly you shut your eyes as with your lips you search my skin? Do you know how you thrust your feet towards me, how you reach out your arms, how the sides of your chest strain against my palms? Are you aware of your fingers brushing against my breast, their tips trying to curl around something to hold on to, but slipping instead against my smooth flesh? Ashwin, do you notice the wetness emerge from my nipples and spill down the slopes of my chest? Is that your tongue that I feel? Are you able to steal a taste or two? Ashwin, your eyes still closed, drops of moisture dappling your nose. Do you know how innocent you look, how helpless, as I guide the nipple towards your mouth? For an instant, I feel like teasing you, drawing my nipple across your lips, but only for a touch and swinging it away. Watching your tongue dart out in confusion, the fingers still opening and closing and curling, worry beginning to crinkle your face, and that helplessness, that exquisite helplessness in your expression, that need for my body, for the nipple that is yours, for the breast I have so cruelly taken away. Yes, love can be capricious, can it not, my sweet? But of course I relent before I even begin. Your look suffuses me with guilt. I let your mouth close around me, I feel the pressure of your gums, your lips. The power in your jaws surprises me. A little more strength, and I can see there will be pain. I lose myself in the rhythm of your intake. Am I imagining it, or is there a parallel rhythm that echoes inside me, a longing that rises through my body and trembles under my skin? I feel myself flush. I feel the color spread through my chest. Then I see your face your forehead losing its worry, your eyelids no longer wrinkled tight. 
I watch the smile trying to train the corners of your mouth, and the heat inside me turns into warmth. There is nothing, I think to myself, as you let go of my nipple and turn to me filled, nothing that can be as satisfying as this. Thank you. So I, I wanted to ask you maybe your thoughts on why you did that, but also maybe to address um, the, because it ties in with how you use mythology, the kind of morphing and blurring of lines that occurs in Hindu mythology between gender, uh, taboos, and things that we might consider taboo or even might be in society, which seem to be permissible within the mythological narrative and how that doesn't seem to translate into uh, our thinking about what is forbidden and what is not. I think that's a very good point that, um, especially in India, I think we are much more in tune with um, a, more fluid a f more fluid idea of gender, for instance. Like Vishnu, for instance, often takes the form of Moini, a woman, and tries to tempt Shiva so that he gets back into the swing of things. Um, the, the fact that uh, gods are often born and reincarnated in various forms where Devi and you know, her male counterpart, whether it be Shiva or Vishnu, they, they sometimes are mother and child, they're sometimes uh, consorts, they're sometimes you know, lovers. So that's one of the things that I play with. And there's also something in Indian society where, again, between a mother and a child, I think there's a much more physical relationship. You see that in religious imagery. If you look at Jesus uh, on the lap of Mary, it's very, uh, very abstract and beatified. But, but with Krishna and uh, Radha or someone, uh, Krishna and his mother, you know, there's, there's a voluptuousness there that you don't see. And interestingly enough, um, the, the character of Mira was really accepted very well in India. I mean, people, women said, you know, this is exactly what I feel, and you really captured that. In the West, women were really a lot less sympathetic, and they felt that Mira should, you know, go and kill herself, basically. Several people told me that. Uh, so they were just, it was just night and day how culture really shapes how people read a text. Okay. Um, Thanks. I, I'll, I'll come back to you again because I, both you and Lionel seem to have a, quite an apocalyptic view of the future and I want to address that a little bit a little later on. But um, before that, I want to move to Lionel because uh, you've been quoted as saying that uh, with Kevin, you broke one of the last, or addressed one of the last taboos. And um, I mean, I did read a, a novel by Doris Lessing called The Fifth Child that also seemed to address the same area, but not in the same way. It was much more cut and dry because the child in, in that story was clearly a monster and it, the, um, what was the cause of it was uh, less blurry. So I wanted to know whether that influenced you at all when you, when you thought about writing Kevin and to talk a little bit more about this taboo subject of women who don't necessarily love or even like their sons or children. Well, I can't claim to have been influenced by that Doris Lessing book because I hadn't read it. So Aha. That's <laughs> my disclaimer. Um, and the, uh, we need to talk about Kevin in 2003. He got a lot of attention, uh, partly because uh, the main character, whose son had grown up to become uh, one of those high school mass murderers, uh, didn't like her son from the beginning, and uh, d but furthermore didn't didn't like being pregnant. Found it uh, akin to the experience of being inhabited by aliens. Um, which, you know, there's a similarity. Um, and and uh, experienced childbirth as uh, a, a very st a strangely alienating and unemotional experience when you're supposed to be overwhelmed with love for your new baby. And uh, even when her child was uh, an infant and on into toddlerhood, she 
didn't feel attached to it. Uh, she felt actually a strange sense of dislike for her own son. And the, the taboo being broken was, uh, had to do with the inviolability, especially between mother and son, not just uh, between mother and child. I think that's then in a, a lot of cultures, and it's probably something that, that Indian culture and Western culture would have in common, that that is, that is the one relationship w w which is, is worshipped, is inviolate, and one, one of the prescriptions uh, in both cultures is that regardless of what your son does, uh, a, a mother sticks by him. And uh, obviously if your son becomes a, a high school killer, uh, that's, that's a real test of that kind of a bond. Um, what interests me about having gone through the experience of publishing a, a, a novel uh, several years ago that got a lot of attention for breaking w what I then identified as one of the last taboos is that it, uh, looking back on it, it seems so tame now. And, um, and I, I think of that statement that you quoted uh, and, and I realize how, how mistaken it is. That is, it wasn't one of the last taboos. There were lots more to come. In, in, as regards the entire topic of this panel, forbidden fruit, the, the notion that there are things that you're you're supposed to not say and and not write about uh, that are, th th I'm afraid that the the sooner we break taboos, and I've seen a lot of them broken uh, throughout my lifetime because I was uh, I grew up in the 1960s. They're just replaced by new ones. So uh, we can talk about having broken the old ones, which has, especially in the West, to do with uh, uh, being able to write and talk about sex. Uh, uh, finally, it's not a, an abomination that uh, uh, we should allow uh, homosexuals to have loving relationships with one another. And now, of course, gay marriage has has become a, a mainstream, and and that's all to the good. I mean, I, I'm I'm really keen on the breaking of of these taboos, and 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 we've moved on from being prescriptive about what kind of a role women can assume, and um, that's all to to the good. But I think, at least in the West, and I won't speak for India. Um, we've moved on to a new set of taboos which has to do with uh, what I would call the tyranny of virtue. And what you can't say now has just moved on. And most of the oppression is now coming from the left. So that uh, there are whole new sets of prescriptions and, and views that you can't voice. And I, because I'm... Uh, I, I hate being told what to do. <laughs> I have an authority problem. I, you don't want to go through airport security with me. <laughs> and I end up being tempted to uh, support people whom I would regard as strange bedfellows. Uh, uh, and uh, I even feel you know, sympathetic with... Uh, evangelical Christians in the, in the American Midwest who are uncomfortable with gay marriage and they can't say so anymore. I mean, I forg forgive me, but, but I want them to be able to say, you know, I, I find that, that that doesn't comport with my religious views. They have to keep their mouths shut now. And I don't like people having to keep their mouths shut. And I would, yeah, I would you know, this, this extends to a whole raft of views that, you know, you're just supposed to hold now. In, uh, that certainly goes for all gender issues. Where the left has gone so far left, it's right. It, it, the the yeah. left has become very uh, uh, totalitarian. That's and right. that's true in Europe as well. It's not just an American phenomenon. Uh, so, but you know, totalitarianism is totalitarianism. Uh, that, it, it, and so it is, you know, that's true the, the left goes left and left and left and left. Well, you know, 
that's the way it works. You end up on the right. And I think that the, that the left in Europe and the United States is increasingly functioning in a right-wing spirit. And as a writer and someone who has a, a, an opportunity to talk to people, um, I think uh, uh, I have some obligation to keep breaking the rules even if they're, they're new rules and they're left-wing rules. I mean, I th the, the, the area w where uh, we have been most muffled in some respects has to do with immigration. And I'm afraid that that muffling has consequences. Uh, and I, if you look at Donald Trump, he, he is one of the results of telling people for decades they have to keep their mouths shut about immigration. And it's created, I mean, when you, when you repress views and you repress the expression of views, you don't eliminate them, but you do make them more virulent, less rational, and more resentful. And Donald Trump is a direct result of all these people being told they have to keep their mouths shut when, you know, it's a little difficult to be, uh, to be part of a country that suddenly changes its ethnic character so quickly. And, and those people need to be able to express that discomfort. I don't know if we have too much time left before we open for questions, but I just wanted to bounce off that a little bit with both you and Manil, and if you guys want to jump in, go ahead. Where the, where, what we consider taboo or what cannot be spoken or what is not uh, liberal or free, giving us the freedom that we want has almost become a cartoon. For example, in the case of Donald Trump, I mean, Donald Trump is like, even three years ago, that would just be unheard of and unthinkable, but I think you're right. The, the, the movement of the left so far into this tyrannical uh, kind of expression and behavior has made it a joke. And similarly, Manil, your use of, the, uh, of, of characters like Super Davy also gave me the same feeling that this, you know, it's almost like both of you have uh, uh, captured the ludicrousness of these firmly held uh, ideals, and I mean, you've made it into a sort of a Bollywood joke, practically. Right, uh, but I, I want to get back to this point, uh, because I, I fully agree with you that, you know, there are aspects of uh, the left that are, that are uh, trying to suppress uh, voices being heard, but, but there's still, um, I, I still think that there's a lack of moral equivalence there that um, is easy to miss. Uh, on the one hand, there are people whose rights are being trampled on and, uh, you know, gay people, I, I'm a gay person and certainly uh, I feel that there are rights that I should have. And it's been a long struggle uh, towards getting those rights. So there is this equivalence kind of debate that, okay, if someone's, I mean, people are certainly, uh, should be able to express their opposition, but to be Shouldn't able be to actually squelch weight. those rights is, is something else. Oh, we're not talking about rights, but we're we talking are, about we freedom are. of no, expression. No, no, there, but there is freedom of expression in the U.S. as well. I mean, there's the whole Fox News, for instance, that just spouts right-wing agenda stuff the whole time. And it's not like these voices have been silenced. I think, I think what you're saying is certainly true at universities, for instance. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, you know, universities are probably the worst offenders in terms of uh, putting restrictions on speech. But even that, fortunately, is turning. But uh, in terms of society in general, uh, I don't quite see that kind of equivalence uh, that, that might be in some people's minds that, you know, the left is as bad as the right. I, I just don't see that. Well, isn't it also about power hierarchies and how the lineage of, of power in a, in a certain um, opinion being expressed, if there's been a long lineage, uh, historical lineage of a power in, in a certain view, um, that that view should keep on being expressed? It's, it's, it's sort of a question worth asking about, uh, as Manuel said, about moral equivalence. Well, what you were saying about moral equivalence, um, and Fox News, et cetera. In the US in particular, there's been a tremendous polarization and ghettoization so that, yes, 
Fox News uh, people watch that channel and not all the other ones. And uh, so that what is, what is taboo is exclusive to your, your community, uh, your self-defined self, uh, community. And, but I'm talking about what is permissible in a larger mainstream sense, which I think, uh, in terms of what's, what's considered acceptable, is still controlled by the, by the left in the United States. And certainly, that's true of Europe. Um, and and I'm, I'm, sorry, I'm not talking about your, you know, you know it's not a matter of, of rights aside from the right to say things. And, you know, this also applies to the, the whole um, Charlie Hebdo situation. I mean, you may not like their cartoons, but it would be nice that it's still legal oh, to yeah, print them. Absolutely, absolutely. Right? But I'm, I'm interested in India. What, uh, is, is there such a schism in India that uh, you know, people just listen to certain types of news stations or read certain newspapers? That polarity that is beginning to emerge quite clearly. I think it's, it's, it seems to be a thing all over. It's just a swing to that where it's either or. Um, you're either this or you're that. And, and I don't know what has happened to independent thinking in the, uh, certainly in the media discourse here, we don't seem to uh, have much of it. If I can just jump in here, I think when we talk about forbidden things, things that cannot be said or written, etc., in India particularly, there are two aspects to this. One is the things that cannot be said because they will make you unpopular, because people will hate you for it, because you're afraid of what your parents may say, because you're afraid of how you will be treated socially. Um, it could be unpopular right-wing views. It could also be talking about sexuality. It could be many different things. But then there is also the thing that is legally forbidden. And in India, I'm afraid we have so many things which we legally cannot say. And everybody, the, the common public actually may have no problems. I mean, for instance, freedom of speech and expression is such a big issue because um, what you say or write may lead to you being killed or arrested. Uh, uh, recently we had an actor being arrested because he was mimicking some god man. And everybody in any case has been mimicking and mocking, mo mocking the films that this god man has been making, setting himself up as a superhero and a messenger of God. Uh, but for an actor to be arrested by the state, by an agency of state that acts in the name of all of us, uh, is a problem and it, it's so far beyond talking about what is just socially forbidden that in India we have a whole different set of challenges. I think we, we're really talking about fighting for our lives and liberty. Well, we've reached the point that I wanted to bring us to. So this is an appropriate time to open it up to questions from the audience. So knock yourselves out. Hello, uh, good morning, yeah. Good morning, here, here. Uh, I mean, just, uh, I, I, I came late, but still I heard something 15 minutes. I just, uh, actually you said one actor, you know, who mimicked uh, some god man, you know, he was arrested. How is that Rustam Baracha was not arrested? He is mimicking everybody. I'm afraid I'm not familiar with uh, people. It's not that, see, everybody mimics everybody at different points of time. That is the nature of mimicking. Yep. And an actor, especially a comic, uh, this is his job. This is what he does. So the point is not who else is not being arrested. The point is why is even one person being arrested? Uh, Rustam Baracha is 1,000 times more famous than uh, this person. He has mimicked about 1,000 people, 1,000 Swamiji's. Why the government did I, not uh, I think him. she's answered that question. I've already answered uh, I have a question here. With the translation you have done from Telugu, how is the English one received by the readers? I have not done that translation, ma'am. I have included an excerpt from that book in an anthology. The translation was done by... Um, Another person Sandhya Mulchandani. by Sandhya Mulchandani, uh, and the book has been around for a few years. It's not a very uh, new translation. Um, 
I did not I do not recall having seen reviews but the book is in print and it's been reprinted I think a couple of times so I'm guessing that it's been received reasonably well um, and uh, I believe that Dr. Mulchandani is also working on another collection of erotic uh, another set of erotic translations from Asia so I have a question for the other panelists as well well in India uh, sex is, has stopped to be a taboo, but what I, I'm not able to, as an author, perhaps as a conservative author, I, I think sex has started selling in India. So all kinds of fiction writers make it a point to include it, whether it's relevant or not. What's your comment on that? Well, first of all, I don't think sex is no longer a taboo. Look at section 377. So, you know, you can't say it's no longer a taboo. Uh, and therefore, I would say that certainly in things that I've written, it's always been an essential part of the story. So I don't know what authors you're talking about in who are fact, using this. In fact, uh, um, all of us who, who sign contracts in India, we sign, I don't know about the US, I can't remember my US contract, but we sign an obscenity clause. Is that correct? And the obscenity laws in, in, in law in India are so vague that they can be interpreted any which way. So, in fact, uh, you do have to consider when you're writing on this subject whether, it, I, I think your point is it's, uh, it's often gratuitous and it's a selling point. But, I mean, uh, I, don't, I don't think that is really the issue. Um, if somebody wants to write about it or it's gratuitous, you have the option not to read that, but... <laughs> um, and if I may, isn't there also maybe a, a, some kind of leveling of the playing field that needs to happen here in India? Because for such a long time it was uh, completely taboo. I, I would argue it's still rather taboo, uh, considering someone objected at the end of our session yesterday. Uh, so maybe, even though I may not be a fan of the gratuitous, poorly written sex, uh, maybe it's something that needs to happen in order for us to pass through this point in history and come into another point in history where we, ca we can maybe say, yes, it's no longer a taboo as, as it is in, in the U.S., uh, as you were saying, Lionel. I, I think that's a good point. Uh, and you can look to places like the U.S. and Europe where there has been a sense of permissiveness in relation to, say, the writing about sex. And the world hasn't ended and people haven't stopped reproducing or they're not w running wildly down the streets with no clothes on. I mean, uh, you, you have an experiment uh, that's been going on for quite some time, uh, and it turns out that the end result is not so much that people have no morality or anything like that. It's more that, oh, uh, sex scenes start being boring, right. and I end up skipping them most of the time. <laughs> It, actually, it, it, it's, it's rather repetitive behavior. Uh, so I think that in that sense, uh, uh, cultures that ha are still much more conservative can look to uh, more uh, liberal societies and discover that the sky doesn't fall. And if I may just add to that, I do not think that actually uh, that what, what you said about uh, you can write or talk about sex quite freely. I think people are writing. I think not enough Indians are reading. Perhaps that is why there's not enough outrage. Because honestly, in all other mass consumption cultures, there are still huge taboos. We still have quite significant censorship. Uh, our censor board snips out, kissing scenes go on for too long, forget sex, just kissing scene is going on for too long, so let's censor that, let's censor this. Um, on television, you still can't produce a lot of content because it's not deemed suitable for family viewing. And in, uh, on the internet, there is a lot of problem. There is, there just, there is I, I would say that sex and sexuality is taboo in our larger culture in so many ways. If you look at just housing, for instance, single people are not given housing you can't rent a place. So, can I can I ask a question? I think I think we're we've already exceeded our.